How many of us think about emergency lighting outside? Ooh, surprising number of hands actually. That's the first time. Normally it's no hands at all. Well, I'm preaching to the converted then, I'm finished. <laughs> okay, emergency lighting outside and beyond the exit door then. And, and this is my worry really, is that I think quite often we talk about um, emergency lighting inside a building. And I think most of us are pretty sort of well versed with what we need to do um, when it comes to those requirements. But what happens when we get to the exit door? Is it survival of the fittest? Every man for himself? Or do we all start reaching for our iPhones and switch the torch function on? <laughs> None of those, of course, because we have proper guidance that tells us what we should be doing. But I wonder how many of us have actually spotted what that guidance is and the lengths that we should be going to when providing emergency lighting beyond the final exit door. So I thought I'd start with what the standards and guidance says. So a good place to start, of course, is 5266, the Code of Practice for Emergency Lighting. And uh, one of the sections there, 5.2.8.1, says near each final exit and outside the building to a place of safety. You're going to hear me say to a place of safety quite a bit over the next few minutes. But what does that mean? What is a place of safety? And the standard defines it as a place in which persons are in no danger. Or I commonly associate it with a place in which persons are no longer under the influence of the building. It goes on, emergency illumination should be provided outside the building and near to each final exit. <laughs> If occupants have to travel to reach a place of safety, this route should form an integral part of the escape route. Ooh, well that's quite clear to me. Let's keep moving on. 50172, to provide illumination onto and along such routes as to allow safe movement towards and through the exits provided to a place of safety to assist dispersal to a place of safety, the external areas in the immediate vicinity, the final exits should be illuminated in accordance with the illumination level for the escape routes given in EN 1838. LG6, where external lighting is provided from a secondary power source, this would normally be deemed to provide the emergency lighting beyond the final exit doors of the building. Okay, that's quite interesting. I'll come back to that. Where there is no secondary power supplied lighting, then the emergency lighting should extend to the place of safety. Goes on. As a general guide, the illuminance in the immediate vicinity and route to the exterior muster point should be no less than 5% of the working interior illumination. Whoa, 5%. It's a little bit high, isn't it? I'll come back to that again in a minute. But to me, the guidance there is quite simple and quite straightforward as to what we should be doing. Yet we don't tend to see, other than the old lunchbox outside the final exit door, we don't tend to see too much emergency lighting beyond that point. But let's think about what we need to do then. So based on that guidance that's been recommended in our standards, what can we do with outside emergency lighting? Well, first of all, I think that we need to break it up. We have the immediate vicinity, and then we have this requirement to provide emergency lighting to a place of safety. So if we start with the immediate vicinity, then again, there's a few considerations with this. So again, if we go back to the guidance, near each exit door intended to be used as emergency, the term near is within two meters horizontally, and illumination levels should be in accordance with EN 1838, all quite simple. But we do need to think about 
what is within the immediate vicinity, such as ramps, steps, staircases, slopes, whatever it might be. As you can see here, we've got a fire escape stair, and of course that needs one lux down all of the treads, or maybe more, um, to provide safe evacuation. Or even in this situation here, where we've got a raised balcony, what you probably can't see there is that um, there are doors, and each one of those doors has an exit sign on the other side of it. So in this instance here, the fittings have to be emergency, and even the bollard at the bottom there is emergency to provide illumination onto those steps as people come off that balcony. So we do need to think about the furniture, the architecture, and the situation um, immediately outside of the final exit door. Let's start to think about to a place of safety then. And again, I think that you can break this down into the public realm and also the private realm, because depending on where the building is and what the building is, then we might approach this in a different way. And let's deal with a difficult one first, the public realm. It's very difficult to provide emergency lighting to a place of safety if your building's right in the centre of London, for example. I should imagine the local council is not going to be too pleased if you start digging up the road and put emergency bollards in to take the people to the other side of the street. So how can we get around this? Well, there's certain things that we can do from the building, of course, building mounted luminaires. And of course, LED technology has now uh, allowed us to produce um, emergency floodlights quite easily where, of course, we couldn't do that with discharge technology previously. But a lot of it actually comes down to the risk assessment. And, of course, Roger spoke quite a lot about this at the beginning. And my fundamental worry is, is that these risk assessments just don't get carried out at all. But this is where the risk assessment should come into play. And we should risk assess uh, the risks, the building type, the usage, the people that are in it. Where is the place of safety? Where are we trying to get them to? Is the local authority street lighting? Can it be relied upon? Can it be incorporated into the risk assessment and included as a part of the emergency lighting? Now, that might sort of ring alarm bells with a few of you. I know it certainly does me, relying on, uh, relying on local authority lighting to provide or be used in an emergency situation. But sometimes it might be that there is no other option. But it must be risk assessed and it must be managed correctly. So street and public lighting could be used as a secondary source. However, we've got to ask a number of questions. Can it be relied upon? Will it be switched on at the time that we need it? Does the local authority adopt any dimming or switching strategies? And of course, we need to carry out regular reviews as well because policies change. But also, and fundamentally, the building owner and occupier is not in control of the maintenance of that street lighting either. So if that street lighting came into disrepair, then of course it would be uh, impossible to maintain that. And if any of you have spotted on that picture that I started with, you can see a prime example of that right there. So it does become a little bit tricky when we talk about emergency lighting to a place of safety in the public realm. But there are various solutions around it, but the, the primary need is for a risk assessment and consultation. And that's where we should be starting to understand what the risks are, how we can mitigate those risks, and then what technologies and solutions are available to us to be able to then uh, get around that. In the private realm, of course, it's much easier because generally the land around that building will be also owned by the building owner or occupier. And this is when, when we can start to um, think a little bit um, more freely, I guess. So first of all, we need to define, well, where are the muster points? Where are the assembly points around this building? And we need to provide emergency lighting at those points. Invariably, there will be a fire marshal in charge of that point that will be responsible for a group of people. They'll have a register that will have to be ticked off as to the accordance to uh, as to whether people are there or not. So we need emergency lighting to be able to carry out that um, task. 
And then we need emergency lighting along the route to get to that muster point. So if people have to travel from the building to that point, which invariably they do, then emergency lighting is needed along there as well. And just as we would in an interior application, if there are any risks, we need to highlight those as well along the way. So let's just come back to this issue that uh, is raised in, in uh, LG6 then. So as a general guide, the illuminance in the immediate vicinity and route to the exterior muster point should be no less than 5% of the working interior illuminance. I've spoken to the author of LG6 and we've had a bit of a debate about this. And I think that probably it's not written in the context that it was meant for. And I think what we need to think about actually are the various differing situations that we have um, when uh, people are inside a building and then plunged into sudden darkness. And we need to maybe think about how we deal with emergency lighting, not only inside the building, but also outside of the building. So for example, let's take a supermarket. A supermarket can easily be lit to in excess of a thousand lux. Suddenly going from a thousand lux to half a lux, the eye's not too good at doing that. The eye's pretty good at going from dark to light conditions. The adaptation time is quite quick, but going from light to dark conditions, the eye struggles to do that um, quickly. So could that actually pose as a risk? And then depending on how uh, people are exiting that area and how quickly they might be escaping from that high illuminance area to an outside environment, then maybe we do need to think about slightly higher illumination levels to aid that process. Or even in um, applications where we have high risk emergency lighting, where 10% of the mains light level needs to be provided, again, going from that higher light level to lower light levels may pose an issue. And this really should be something that, uh, again, is included in the risk assessment. So what me and the author discussed was maybe we should consider something along the lines of a threshold zone. As you come out of the building, then do we need to allow time for people's eyes to adapt to the lower lighting conditions? Now, clearly, if somebody has traveled a long way through the building to get to that point, their eyes would have adapted by the time they actually go out of the exit door. But if they're coming out straight out of a, a, a supermarket, for example, where the eye is adjusted to a thousand lux straight out the door into very low light levels, then could there be a, a risk associated with that? So I wouldn't necessarily get too hung up on the 5% because quite clearly in practice, that's gonna be quite a tall order to reach 5%. And I think the appropriate guidance would be to match the illumination levels um, outside of the building to whatever you're using inside of the building, but do give considerations again to what the mains lighting levels are and then what the emergency lighting levels are. Just to end then, um, a question that I get asked quite a lot uh, with regards to residential buildings, what should I be doing in this situation where you've got um, a balcony type walkway, which is effectively classed as external but it might be several levels up uh, in a building. Do I need to provide emergency lighting along those walkways to the central stair cores uh, and then out of the building? Well, part B of the building regulation gives us a little bit of help on this. So we can see there at the top, residential, all common escape routes, uh, except in two storey flats. So basically anything over two storeys, then emergency lighting is needed in all common escape routes. And that little footnote there says, including external escape routes. So if you ever are confused over that, then part B does give us quite clear guidance as to what's needed. Thank you.